Hello, this is Tim Sommer with 89U Music View, or just Music View maybe now. I'm here with Andy Partridge. Hello, Andy. Well, I'm waving down the microphone. Yeah. You can't um, see it. Well, XTC have a n relatively new album out in the States. It's called Black Sea, and they've been trekking all across this great big country of ours to promote it and play it, and haven't you been doing that? Uh, we have. In fact, I bought my new pair of Pathfinders with a compass in the heel and little badger tracks to see where I'm going. In, in the last year or so, you seem to have spent a lot of time in America. Yes, I've come to that conclusion as well. Uh, so the American uh, passport people running out of visas to give us. Uh, th th this tour is, uh, as, as you say, we have only have a relatively new arm. Um, it's, it's going out of the charts now, so uh, it's not a please buy the album, it's a sort of a thank you for buying the album tour. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, we can't uh, hope to, uh, to sell any more, really. I think we're at the moment we're just preaching to the converted on this tour. Yeah, I imagine this isn't a big breakthrough album, but it did get a substantial amount of airplay on the college stations. I imagine and yeah, I've the underbelly the of the big the straighter time. stations are playing uh, the more straighter tracks. I suppose uh, that's about it. We're also having lots of experience playing to inflatable audiences. As last night in Passaic, New Jersey. So uh, you've been playing a lot of these bigger halls. Uh, some big ones, some little ones, it's, it varies, you know. We'll go anywhere, r literally. Now, last night you played with Joan Jett and Jules Holland, and you were on top of the bill, weren't you? Yeah, although somebody came backstage and said I had a great boogie-woogie style of piano playing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, because you're at the, the top of the bill, does that mean going on last means you're the least famous? I didn't say anything to that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, Jules Holland's good fun, so if you see Jules Holland and the Millionaires anywhere, go and give them a look. That's all I can say, really. It wasn't so long ago that you played Madison Square Garden, right? That is correct. Yes. How was that? What's that like? Uh, well, we did two gigs there. I was supporting the Cars. Who? Um, who need a little support. Um, the first gig we did was... <coughs> we had a, f a few technical problems, so we had to leave the stage a little bit earlier, but it was quite good. The audience seemed to be warming to us. Uh, we thought it was going to be very hard going because they were, you know, as soon as they got in there, the joints were coming out, the bottles of wine were coming out, you know. They tend to uh, sometimes treat you a little bit like television and sort of sit there and thinking if they don't like you, they can maybe reach out and turn you over, you know. But uh, we did all right. The second night was, was really quite good. Uh, the usual thing, like when you support a band, a big band, is you, you don't get sound check or anything like that, so you have to play a lot of things off the cuff and just um, well, improvise your sound and, and make out as you go along, you know. But it's quite good fun. Is it unusual playing to people who are way, way up there and people who are in back of you and on your sides instead well, of just at a club where they're down? I prefer medium sized places. Some clubs are too small and, and uh, there's no sense of. of and displaying yourself to people because I think you have to have a sense of that to to be able to uh, to communicate. You know, it's no, it's not fair just to talk to the front row. Uh, and and some places are too big where you know if I haven't got my glasses on, I just can't see the the, the front row, let alone the back row. Does that make it easier or more difficult? Uh, well, I like to see what I'm playing to, yeah. Because if if it's just lights shining in your eyes and you know there's an audience out there about four miles away very difficult to uh, to get any feedback going you know it has to you have to over ham it up to 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 make any contact and that's really not what we're about we, we're hams but not of not of the over variety how long has black sea been out oh um how long has it been out historian any idea how long has it been out uh, well i've been in charge for about 22 weeks over here so um, 22 weeks plus, what, a month or so? So it's been over, been out a pretty substantial time. Mm. Yeah, and uh, how many albums do you have before that? Uh, three. This is the fourth. We have three albums, two EPs, uh, another LP of, of dub material, so I suppose five albums in a way, and uh, countless singles, and there's little shots at the chart. Yeah, I think we're going to hear. Well, I don't think it's one of the countless singles, but we are going to hear a track off the album right now. And this is from Black Sea, and it is XTC, and it is called Burning With Optimism. That was XTC with Burning With Optimism, and I'm here with Andy Partridge of XTC. You worked on this album with Steve Lillywhite, and you've worked in the past with him, too. Mm -hmm. And he's gotten quite a reputation in Britain as a 
as an ace producer. Mm. Yeah. Would you? I haven't heard anyone I've talked to yet who have a nasty word to say about him or anything. Dreadful breath and awful footwear. Um, no, he's all right. He's okay. Uh, I don't know whether we'll be doing the next album with him because we have to keep moving on, really, or else the next album would just be Black Sea Part 2 or even Drums and Wires Part 3. So um, I'm not too sure who we'll be using again, but yes, we did use him for this one and Drums and Wires. I think you can hear the, the similarity in sound, like bottom-heavy drums and... Uh, very alive sounding instruments but we fancy a change of direction again so you know another producer change of direction it's like a change of underwear you know you get fed up with wearing the same pants all the time just want to change them over the course of your of all your albums you seem to have gone from sort of a quirky sort of pop and now my first reaction on hearing black sea was that you had been very very influenced by like revolver era beatles and like kinks and small faces from like something else period and stuff like that how mm. off base would that be no that's probably true because we all grew up through the through the 60s and started furtively buying records with our pocket money in the 60s and i know the first records i bought were the uh, kinks beatles monkeys small faces stuff like that so i've obviously taken all that stuff in as a as a kid and then you know when it comes to my turn to uh, to stop being sponge and start squeezing some stuff out obviously it's going to come out a bit like that i mean we're going to influence people now you know when uh kids listening to us now buying their first records now we're going to impress them and they're going to be um putting stuff out in another 10 15 years that's going to have traces of us on it and traces of other bands going around now so it's just plain old evolution really yeah you know? i think it would be very wrong to say uh, oh no no we're nothing like these bands uh, with, that would be very wrong because uh, you know that's when we were absorbing music. Um, I don't absorb music too much nowadays. In fact, I think I've stopped altogether. I'm just busy doing the squeezing out process. There's do you think? Do you think that's common amongst people who perhaps started <coughs> as musicians? Four yeah, or five especially years ago when you did. Especially when you're in the process of learning an instrument. And then I think you get to a certain stage where you just not so keen on learning anymore. You you just want to start putting out all the stuff you've brought in because um, if you just keep taking in and taking in it's very frustrating you want to you, you know you've got to put it out the other side um, and that's the same for anything whether you read books whether you're learning an instrument whether you're you know writing stuff you just you take in so much and then I think anybody normally would take in a certain amount and then would want to either emulate what they've taken in or or put out their own um, contortion of that so yeah, a very natural process. Yeah. Me being a, just an average human being, you know, that's what I do. Yeah. It. How long, how distant, in terms, when you talk about this evolution and things like that, how distant does a time go, maybe, when you think of 1976 and 1977, when XTC were maybe just starting out and people didn't know wh how to separate the punk bands from the more progressive bands, et cetera, et cetera. You know? mm. How distant does that seem? <coughs> <coughs> how distant does it seem uh, I think once you start touring and like sort of hawking your ass around different countries of the world it, uh, A your memory gets shot to blazes and B uh, it does seem to remove itself very quickly like we we have been uh, myself Terry and Colin have been in, in a group since 1973 uh, we didn't play too good but you know we, we started getting up in an amateur status and making noise uh, we had a continual fourth members coming and going uh, and around 75 we formulated the, the fact that we didn't want to play long guitar solos and things we wanted to play uh, like three minute pop style songs you know commercially uh, tainted songs uh, as opposed to playing like a 15 minute guitar solo with a piece of singing at one end and a piece of singing at the other we actually wanted to accompany ourselves and sing songs so we sort of said, well, look, this is what we really want to do. And around 75, we mutated into uh, XTC. And it's more or less the basis of what you heard on white music. The first album, in fact, the first album was a lot of that material we'd been playing, some of it since 73, and a lot of it since 75. And it eventually got down on plastic in 77. When did Barry Andrews leave the band? Uh, after Go To, the second album. He wanted, uh, well, he was writing a lot of songs and we didn't think they were just all that good. You know, he'd started writing and he thought, well, I'll write. And he came up with an avalanche of songs and 
was um, asking us to play, and we were we were playing them in the studio. We were doing Go To in Abbey Road at the time. Uh, and we were actually playing his songs and like giving them a fair crack of the whip. But when we finished them, we thought, well, mm, they're not really too good. Uh, and he was obviously getting a bit upset. I think we put two of the songs on the album as a token gesture and that was super tough in my weapon. Uh, and he, he just felt like kept down. I think if he'd have stayed with the band and, and and wrote more stuff, I think he would have got into the swing of writing. I mean, you worked can't, in a more natural. Like sort Spark of. said, you know, you can't pick up the violin and be Yehudi menu and straight away. And he was writing these songs and thought they were amazing straight away, and they weren't. Uh, so he just wanted a band of his own uh, to play his own material, and, th and that's a bit weird because he left basically because of this. And uh, since he has left, he's he's more or less done nothing but session work for other people, mm -hmm. like Iggy Pop and mm -hmm. Robert Fripp and stuff like that. Yeah, he toured here with League of Gentlemen, was didn't he? Or yeah, I think so. He was yeah. here with League of Gentlemen. Yeah, because I remember them billing him as XXTC or something like <laughs> formerly of a XXTC. terrible tag. Yeah, something something like that. How did his departure change the sound of the band? I mean, oh, radically straight away. It was. I mean, a, a very big identifiable lump of the band walked out the door, said, "My my," <coughs> and you didn't try to replace him. Well, initially. I think I was worried more because uh, Barry's sound had stamped the sound of the band out in people's ears over two albums and a few singles. And there it was walking out the door. I thought, oh, hell, what should we do? Uh, we ban began to think that if we got a keyboard player and it was whoever they were going to be, they were just going to be another Barry Andrews. So we thought, well, let's just get somebody in that we know very well and we know we're going to get on with and we know it's going to work as a team. Uh, more or less regardless of what they play and it just happened to be Dave who plays the guitar we've known for years uh, who's been in lots of local bands of very degrees uh, we just got him in because we knew him and we wanted like a, a team feeling rather than uh, somebody that was making a specific sound I think we're going to hear another one off of Black Sea right now um, I think this man nodding towards us is, uh, is <laughs> indicating that we must I think producer Pablo is dropping hints here so I think we're going to hear Living Through Another Cue but what you just briefly said before is a bit of a protest song or Yeah, not so much a protest song um, just more a way of uh, putting up with the inevitable perhaps Yeah So the when the bombs come down, you know you can only smile Okay, so this is XTC with Living Through Another Cuba that was living through another Cuba and um, Andy perhaps more groundbreaking form than that you've that XTC or you personally have worked in his dub or rock dub which is very very rare and you seem to have done about as much of it and as well as anyone you've yeah. done um, There's go plus and take plus away and right take away, yeah. and also uh, I think we've been using some of the techniques on on the straighter songs on on the the official albums you know getting to use the same techniques on some of the songs has, hasn't somebody ever walked up to you and said you can't dub rock it's something that can't be yeah, done yeah oh, critics have said you know uh, they've, they've said it was terrible things everything f from really racist comments like uh, I'm not the right colour to do it and uh, you shouldn't do it with this sort of music I mean that, those, that's that's just crazy arguments I mean, in fact it's not even an argument they're just crazy very one sided very blind statements why can't you do any sort of process with any sort of music? You know, what's to what's to say that you can't? I think probably a lot of listeners don't quite understand dub process or what exactly dub means. Do you think maybe you can explain it just a bit? Yeah, it's very uh, very easy thing. Uh, when you record a, a track, be it for a single or an album or whatever, you record the instruments down microphones that go onto a piece of uh, two inch wide tape that's composed of anything from two to four to eight to 16, to 24, to even 32 little bands or tracks with each instrument on each band or track. Each separated and each, each can separated, be separated. Right, so you put it through a, a thing called a mixer which um, uh, you can break down, you can listen to each track individually and listen to each instrument. You can listen to a cymbal or a guitar or a voice or an organ or, or anything and you can uh, balance these tracks up to literally form any shaped landscape of that song that you want to. Um, what you hear on the record is a, uh, is a particular balance, almost like a graph, you know, a particular balance of those controls. Uh, and there's no rule to say that you can't go back into the studio, put the tape back on again, put it back through the mixer and rebalance it, take some of the things away completely 
um, electronically affect things that are left. So you completely change the the landscape, the vision of the song. Um, Somebody once described dub as using the studio as an instrument. It is, yeah. It's using the mixing disc uh, as like uh, almost like a welding torch. You've you've all gone into the studio and you've built a car, and this car is track A from album B, and everybody knows it as, as this track, and they can they always hear it like that on the record. And then you take the car back into the studio, you get your welding equipment, your mixing desk, and you cut it all down again, and then you put it together in a different way. You know, you make a, a, a different sculpture out of it, using the same ingredients, but uh, it just comes out radically different and just as interesting and just as valid. Um, after saying all that, it would be really appropriate if we were to throw one of your dub tracks on right now, but that's not what we're going to do, so there. Um, this yeah, one, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. So this is another track from Black Sea. It's called "No Language in Our Lungs." And are there any words you'd like to say before it about it before we play it? Um, it's funny you should ask me that because it's basically about um, lack of communication or communication breaking down and failing. Um, so no, I just think you should glue your lug holes to the wireless and listen to the song. Okay, this is "No Language in Our Lungs" from XTC. No, that was no language in our lungs from XDC. I think we are going to say good night for tonight's music view. Um, I'm Tim Somer, your host, and I've been here with Andy Partridge of XTC. Isn't that right, Andy? That is correct, and I'm waving bye-bye now. Okay, now Andy's waving bye-bye, and I'll just nod good night.